So there was these three guys walking through the woods and they came up on this big river. And, uh, you know, I mean, it was in flood stage and they're like, how are we gonna get across it? So the, the first guy says, I'm gonna pray. So he says, oh God, give me the strength to get across this river. And boom, immediately God gave him these big old strong arms, and these big old strong legs. He looked like Tarzan, you know, that came out in that last movie. And he just jumped in the river and just swam across. It took him two hours, but he got across it. The second guy says, oh, that worked pretty good for him. He says, I'm gonna pray too. He says, oh God, give me the, the strength and the tools I need to get across this river. And God gave him some big old arms, boom, big old legs, boom, and gave him a boat. And he got in a boat and he rowed across it in 30 minutes. And the third guy comes up there and he says, man, that worked pretty good for those guys. He says, God, give me the strength, give me the tools and give me the intelligence to get across this river. And boom, God turned him into a woman. <laughs> and he got the map out, looked at it, walked five minutes up there, walked across the bridge. Not that hard. Genesis chapter one, I wonder what page it's on in this Bible. Page one, <laughs> what do you know? Page one, if you can't find page one, mm, God bless you. So you're probably there, right? I mean, there are a few other pages in front of page one, right? Genesis 1, 27 and 28, think about what's being said here. God created, it says man here, but it's man and woman in his own image. In the image of God, he created, I'd say them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them. And God said, be fruitful and multiply. Right there, you know that God invented sex. Isn't that something? Some people thought the devil invented it. Wrong. Be fruitful, multiply and fill the earth subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves. Okay, so what's the key idea there? We're created in what? God's image. We're not created in the image of a Neanderthal man or a monkey or something like that. We're created in God's image, right? That's kind of what I just, you know, and keep your Bible because we're gonna go to another place in a minute. But for the past several weeks, we've been talking about uh, the, the society that we live in. And uh, we've discussed the idea of temple. Let's put that diagram up here, kind of review here. This is an ancient temple. And here you had the outer courts, the inner courts, and the Holy of Holies. And as you moved this way, you got closer to the God, the deity that was in there. And in a Hebrew temple, Yahweh was in there. There was no uh, graven image, no idol, no, no statue of, of anything, uh, but the very presence of God was in there. Um, I felt the presence of God in here a little bit ago. Did anybody? All right, now in uh, ancient Near Eastern temples, they looked a lot like this and all, but in here they would have their own uh, God. Dagon or, or Baal or whatever would be in here and there'd be a, a statue, an idol, and people would bow down in there. And what we came to discover uh, the last month was that we actually, all of our life is a temple, except that ours is a secular temple, the one we live in here in America. And we went, in, I don't have time to go into all that, but we have this uh, part in our society, we have this part, and in there, self is the deity self is the god of our um, society self is the one in the holy of holies and we've been talking about that um, for a while so how did we get here and what are the dangers of that in order to get to the bottom of that we need two definitions this morning the one definition is the vertical self the vertical self, up until about the last 50 years in America and a little bit more than that in the other Western countries, people viewed themselves uh, in a vertical way. Let's look at that diagram if we could, where God is the ultimate authority. And here's me in my life, it just could be a female, it just happens to be this hipster. Look at his shoes, he's a hipster, uh, hipster guy. And uh, his concern is for his soul. 
what's going on inside and then there's the eternal consequences uh, for sin you know this was the traditional view starting in the greco-roman world even the greeks viewed this kind of stuff but obviously this is definitely a, a, a christian thing where where we understand that there's one god and he's the ultimate authority and we understand that there is a judgment day there's a heaven and a hell depending on how we deal with this right here so just leave that up there till i get to the next one so this is the vertical self and up until about the last 50 years in america even if a person didn't go to church even if a person didn't know god they still understood these kind of concepts and really if you think about it our laws are based on this thing uh, uh it's based on a concept here of good and bad so so we know that we need to be good or we get thrown in jail and we know that and where do we get good from we get the definition of good from god so so we know we need to be good and then we know that there's ramifications for not being good and based on the ten commandments and some things like that and so there's some moral absolutes like you can't just go out and kill somebody uh today at heb because they cut in front of you trying to grab the skim milk or something if you do that there's going to be some some consequences for that that stuff is based off of this idea right here so there's good and bad and with good and bad if you do good in general not that sometimes bad things don't happen to good people but in general if you do good good things happen to you there's a whole bunch of people incarcerated this morning that did some bad things and bad things are happening to them they don't it's not a happy place to be incarcerated this morning so the ultimate self implies that there is some ulti ultimately we're judged by god and our and our lives need to reflect the fact that we're going to give, give account one day to this ultimate authority and so what we do in this life somehow plays into that okay so for the most part even though our laws are based on this stuff and people who follow Jesus know something about this for the most part we do not live our lives like this we live our lives another definition the horizontal self so let's put that one up there this is how people in America today and really sitting in churches today really view themselves um, as a matter of fact, this is a product of our secular temple culture. You know, it's like the fish in the fishbowl. He doesn't know he's wet. You and I live in the secular temple and we don't know how wet we are to some degree. So let me just describe this horizontal view. This is where most of us live. We, uh, instead of God being our judge, peers are our judge how do I look to others and this is the ultimate thing right here and I'm going to explain some of that today and then what do I live for what are my goals not not for heaven and hell but for that's a big word I can't even pronounce that but if you cut some of the end of it off it basically means temporary stuff I live for temporary stuff um, you see it all the time uh, and I'm not saying anything is bad about what I'm about to say, but there's people that uh, totally live for like a destination wedding, going to $30,000 of debt to go have an experience. That's a temporary thing, right? Or we, we take out a loan so we can go on a cruise. And, and so the big thing is having experience. And so that's, that's temporary. And then there's the materialism thing. And you, you get caught up in that whether you want to or not because you are bombarded by the marketing and advertising industry. I mean, you can't even get out of bed hardly in the morning without somebody saying to you that the shoes you have aren't good enough. You gotta go get another pair. The jacket you have isn't good enough. Oh boy, that guy looks cool, man. If I only had a Patagonia jacket, you know, I could do this. Or I could, you know, all that kind of stuff. All right, so whether you like it or not, I don't want to be mean about it, but whether you like it or not, you live a whole lot more in this one than you do in that other one. So let me compare and contrast those two real quick um, because there are quite, uh, uh, there's some real big differences there. And I think maybe we even have a slide about the compare contrast. Okay. So 
That's a great slide. By the way, John Zmigley is back from Florida and, and he did a good job today, didn't he? On this one, I just want to hit about six concepts here, not real hard, but on this one, God is the judge. God is the judge of how I'm doing, right? On this one, my peers are the judge of how I'm doing. The, right? So social media, am I getting likes? My peers are my ultimate judge. If I'm not getting likes, oop, pull that down, redo. I, I gotta get, I, my peers are the judge. Um, this one really has eternal as the goal. Well, I should put it there, eternal as the goal. This one, as I just said, has, has, has temporary as the goal. Now, and you can see how you got there because most of you went up to the government schools like I did and they told you you came from a monkey. If you came from a monkey and they also told you there's no such thing as the afterlife, I have all kinds of friends that believe that. They, they call themselves one dimensional people. They, don't, they believe when you're dead, you're dead. Just like a armadillo on the side of the road that got ran over this morning, he's dead. That's all there is to it. So if that's all there is to it, then what I need to live for is pleasure right now. Because this is it. The minute, the minute the clock is done ticking, I'm done. So I might as well have a ball while I'm here. All right, so, so, so this is eternal. This is temporary. Uh, this one has a lot to do with work ethic. Because when I work hard, I get rewarded and it builds character in me. And so a lot of that has work ethic. And I'll be honest with you, that's how America kind of got where we are. I mean, the problem is we were so successful, now it's killing us. But two, three generations ago, especially the de Depression generation, 1930s, these guys understood work ethic. This guy lives for the play ethic, though. He works, he has a job, he understands if he goes to, to work, he'll have some money, but his money goes towards the next play thing. The next experience, I get to go hike Indonesia or whatever. Okay, so we're, we're not sitting in, we're not being judgmental here today. We're just trying to get some definitions so we can talk about some stuff. Um, this one has to do with identity. Who really, really am I? And this one has to do with image. Who do I make you think I am? Um, I just got a couple more. This one in the end leads to wholeness, wholesomeness, wholesomeness. This one leads to fragmentation. And I'll explain that in a minute, but you can see why. If I'm, if I'm really concerned with how you view me, and the problem is there's like 30 of you guys, then I've got to put on 30 different faces for each different group of people. So you see how that could lead to a fragmented type deal? Um, Self-discipline is what uh, goes on here when you're developing your soul, soul issues. Um, Self-esteem is what goes on here. This was a big push in government education in the 90s, is we got to teach kids to have self-esteem, high self-esteem. And uh, they do. A lot of them have a lot of high self-esteem. The problem is they don't live in reality. So when they have really high self-esteem and they don't feel like going to work and they get fired from their job at Subway, real reality hits, but they still got really high self-esteem. There's something wrong with the Subway manager, not me, right? Uh, I'm almost done. This one has to do with inner self, deep inner life issues, uh, inner life issues here. And um, this one over here has to do with outward appearance outward appearance and this one has to do with facts facts like there is real place called heaven a real place called hell and what am I gonna do about it and this one has to do totally with feelings how do I feel I think I'll, I think I'll, I'll, I'll quit going to church you know because I, I, I don't feel uh, I don't I don't like I don't feel it's all about feelings okay so that's the two definitions that we kind of need before we can move forward here. But do you see why this guy, we got a lot of this guy in us? And maybe, you know, you're sitting here in God's temple today because you have some of this in you. But the battle you face is between these two. 
And a lot of your friends live totally over here, totally over there, right? And so uh, only fit on a good Sunday, only still on a good Sunday, there's more people that are in a church than are at an in, uh, that filled NFL stadiums, even in the middle of NFL season. So we still have 15% of Americans that somehow go to a place of worship. But that means there's 85% that are totally trapped in this, probably. And of the ones that are in church, most of us are this guy anyway. And that's why nothing seems to work. You don't seem to be growing in the things of God. And it's because you're in God's temple, but you're still this guy. If I could just be that blunt. Okay. So the, the, the difference is drastic. And so the secular temple is built on the horizontal. Just leave those up there until we need the next diagram. And um, what, what, what scores over here is youth, glamour, sexy, cool, hip, and being relevant. That's, that's where you get your rewards over here. And you think about it. Uh, I got I like to listen to Sirius XM radio and 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 when you listen to classic rock stations on Sirius XM radio you get the real scoop of what's going on with Mick Jagger and Kiss and some of these bands that were in their heyday Led Zeppelin in their heyday in the late 60s and early 70s and to my horror these guys are still out performing <laughs> Mick Jagger is 75 years old Matter of fact, remember when he played Super Bowl something or other and he said, uh, and they played, I, I can't get no satisfaction, he said, and he said to the microphone, he said, we could have played, it was Super Bowl 40 or something like that, he said, we, we could have played this at the first one, because <laughs> the song was out. So it, we got this. Bob Seger, I heard him the other day say, he's going to keep going until his voice gives up on him, and he's like 78, 77. Kiss is doing, uh, still doing concerts. <laughs> what is that about? It's about this. I get rewarded for youth and glamour and sexy and cool and being relevant. So if I'm Madonna, I have to keep in reinventing myself to stay on the cutting edge of what's cool, even though I'm like almost, seven, you know, Madonna's not, she's probably set close to 70. So that leads to a totally fragmented person. So if you're having to play act all the time and pretend in order to be liked, because like is the ultimate goal of that thing, then you end up, like I said a second ago, with a lot of different selves that you put out there. So especially, and you, you know, you see this on fake book, that the reason some people make fun and call it fake book is because you don't put your bad side out there. You put your good side. Matter of fact, you put better than you out there. And I've heard of people having to total meltdowns because they see their friends' marriages and actually think what they saw on Facebook is how happy they are. And then they look at their sorry husband and go, what kind of mess am I in? So in the end, when this is where we live, we get our significance based on what other people say about us. Plain and simple. So I want you guys to like me, so I put on my best face for you to like me, right? And so, but then there's another group over here that I interact with, so I want them to like me too, so I kind of morph to make them like me, and then I want these guys to like me, so I'm, I kind of morph to make that and make that and make that, and in the end, my life looks like a smoothie whole bunch of stuff thrown smashed whipped up so if you like pineapple there's a little bit of pineapple in there if you like a little coffee flavor there's a little coffee flavor i throw a little bit of that it's, it's right there and all that kind of stuff so you can see how you can you can see really the, the terribleness of it having to always stay on the cutting edge of being cool that's it's tough so the horizontal self then says that we live for our pleasure 
And there's no rules, so we do what feels good. We live for hedonism, sexual freedom. Sexual freedom is a huge one in our culture. Uh, in order to have sexual freedom, I really can't have commitments to one person or something like that. So, the, so we're really low on staying committed to some things. We want to play the field. We want to do whatever I want. And so we, in the end, this guy builds his life on his flesh, his flesh. What his flesh wants, he does. Fleshly pleasures. Feed the flesh, whatever the flesh wants to do, let's do it. Now this began to show up in the 1940s here in America, right after World War II, in the early 50s, and uh, the, the kind of the word for those people were beatniks, uh, James Dean kind of group. Uh, of course, you had Elvis and that whole thing. And then that moved into the 60s with the hippie movement, but you gotta understand, even in the 60s, the hippie movement, they, that's totally this deal right here. But those guys weren't mainstream. That's why you had uh, Merle Haggard singing I'm an Okie from Muskogee. You had a, a real clash of cultures between, oh yeah, and no, this is how we used to be. So the culture wars happened there. But guess which one of these actually won? This one. This is totally mainstream now. I mean, it's not on the edge anymore. I mean, back in the 40s and the 50s, the beatniks, they were known for hanging around with uh, people who practice homosexuality and stuff like that. In the 40s and 50s, that was way over there on the edge. Where do you live now? Complete mainstream. This is completely where we are. So, um, and by the way, one of the big deals here, it, it already said it, is sexual freedom. Don't tell me anything about money, sex, or anything. This is a big deal, big, big, big deal. That's why you can't legislate against it. You can't pass a law and say, okay, these are the confines of sex. No, when the whole society is like this, a law like that gets thrown in the trash. I mean, I think George W. tried it. He tried to get a, a deal, a, a, marriages between a man and a woman and all that right and i think he maybe i don't know but anyway it got trashed by the supreme court why because this is who we are period so you can maybe be some moral christian over here and you're a little dot in this whole thing and you're over here going uh i don't believe that stuff's really right this culture just ran over you like 18 wheeler that train done left the station baby you know, and we talked about it last week about what kind of church are you going to go to. Uh, but anyway, that's a whole other story. Now, um, an interesting person in this is Marilyn Monroe. Let's put her picture up. I, we had to, <laughs> we saw some pictures of Marilyn this morning and we got a good clean one for church. Because <laughs> there's some other ones there. She did more uh, for uh, moving things to, to the kind of horizontal self than a lot of people even give her credit for. Actually, she was a genius in her own way. Uh, she, she was born uh, Norma Jean Baker in Los Angeles. She had a horrible family life and grew up in foster homes and never could get the love from her dad that she wanted. But she was born with pretty good looks. She wasn't blonde, she was brunette. And um, being in LA, she was kind of around the Hollywood scene. So she learned that if she went to the right parties and she got invited to them because she was so good looking and she could get acting parts and some things like that, uh, that how she felt powerless and unloved, she could leverage that with her good looks and do something about it. And so she invented, Norma Jean invented Marilyn. And she uh, dyed her hair blonde, and she, uh, she got very wealthy. She did seduced some of the most famous men in that generation. She created uh, a certain kind of walk that had some, some swag. <laughs> this is before swag. I don't know what it is. By the way, she, uh, even though she was probably a genius, she uh, helped us with this image of the dumb blonde thing. Sexy, available, 
dumb blonde, come take me kind of thing. Marilyn Monroe did probably more for that than it, but she's a really good example of the horizontal self, because, and I don't want to beat up on her or anything like that, but, because it's a tragedy, her life, but, but, but she's a really good example of the horizontal self because there's this complete split between the private and the public. So what's going on in her private world and what's going on in her public persona that she puts out there are two really different things. And her biographer, who did a good job on her story of her life, said that while the out the public side was flourishing, uh, money, all these kind of things, fame, changing the culture, really, uh, changing the world culture, really, um, the inside was still looking for daddy. And the tragedy of her life is she died at age 36 alone in her bedroom, in her mansion, alone. When her housemate found her, she had a telephone receiver in her hand. Nobody to call at her darkest hour. And that's how she died. Because that's where the horizontal self goes. And so we're, we're sad about that. Uh, it's just not a good thing. So... The, the, so we read the scripture this morning, Genesis 1, 27, 28. The image of God is where I'm supposed to be going. I'm not supposed to be going to this image or some other image that I, that I need you guys to like me and all that kind of stuff. So the fragmented life is confused life. It's an insecure life and it's the lonely life. Um... But it kind of begs the question is, what are we supposed to be doing with our, okay, she only had 36 years. She died prematurely. I had a friend, I found out yesterday, dropped dead last Wednesday. Guy was like 61. He wasn't planning on dying that day. So the thing of it is, is our days are numbered. I don't know how many days you have. I don't know how many days I have, but they're numbered. So the question is, what, what am I supposed to be doing with my days? I mean, that's really the whole point. What am I supposed to be doing with my days? Um, am I supposed to be, am I just here for pleasure and to create an image so you guys think I'm cool, sexy, glamorous, hip, whatever? We already know y'all don't think that about me, all right? Or might there be um, another reason, maybe, why I'm here? And, and, I, and Paul, I think, would help us. St. Paul would help us on page 1180. Let's go there real quick. Uh, Colossians 3. Colossians 3, 1 through 17. I was one time at a seminar at a monastery for two weeks in California, and the assignment was to memorize this. I didn't really understand why. When you try to memorize scripture, you really get it. Because you put on three by five card and all day long you're referring back, referring back. What was that first line? You really get it when you try to memorize it. Colossians 3, 1 through 15. Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, well, this is Paul now. Who is he talking to? He's talking to you. You wouldn't be in church today if Christ wasn't doing something in your life. So... If you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above and not on the things of the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you used to walk when you were living in them. Somebody say, yep. But now you also put them all aside. Anger, wrath, Malice, slander, abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have laid aside the old self with its evil practices and put on the new self, 
who is being renewed to the true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. Verse 11, a renewal in which there is no distinction. God is an equal opportunity employer. Jew, Greek, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, slave, free, black, white, brown, red, purple. Christ is all and in all. So, as those who have been chosen by God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience, bearing with one another, that's tough, forgiving each other, that's tough. Whoever has a complaint against anybody, just as the Lord forgave you, so you should also do it, that's tough. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. That is true. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom and teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thanks, thankfulness in your hearts to God. We did that this morning. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. What is all this about right here? There's a lot of words there. It's about getting back on the right track. The vertical self is about curbing and, and directing the desires of the flesh. And this is the exact opposite of how the horizontal self views the flesh. Well, do you, are you okay with the word flesh? You know what I'm talking about? Do I need to define that? That's, that's my desires and stuff. Um, but why would God want me to train my flesh? Why would God want us to control ourselves? I have three ideas for you. The first one is so that you could flourish in life. I sincerely believe that Joel Osteen is right, that God wants you to have the best life possible. I absolutely believe that. But this can only happen when our desires are put in the right place. Our desires, uh, we control them. We have the power to control them. But the horizontal self would say you can't. They control you. Everything created by God is good. That's what the Bible teaches. But it has to be used in the correct manner. So here's some examples. Bluebell ice cream is a really good example. This is really good stuff. And they almost went out of business a few years ago, and I'm glad that they didn't. Bluebell ice cream is some really good stuff, as long as it is used properly. If I go on a Bluebell ice cream only diet, I won't end up looking like Ralph Potlon back there. If all I did was Bluebell breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I'd be sick. It would not be good for me. But Bluebell in and of itself is not evil. It is a very good thing created by God and some people in Brenham. It's just really good stuff as long as it's used right. Okay, let's talk about sex. So what this whole horizontal self is really sex sells. Isn't it amazing to you that no matter what people are selling, sex is involved in it? I mean, I don't care if it's like breakfast cereal or like uh, tools down at the auto zone, uh, beer especially, what does beer have to do with the girl in a bikini? She ain't gonna look like that if she drinks too much of that. <laughs> so we all know that God created sex because he told us in Genesis today and when used properly, this is fantastic stuff. But what does it look like when it's used wrongly? You don't have to look very far to look at the sex traffic business. It's happening right here on Interstate 35. The kidnapping of young girls and sold into slavery right here in the USA right now. And they are by the thousands. I was talking to a guy the other month who works in an industry that tries to expose 
the predators that are trying to trap these girls and they're on any given day in Austin, Texas, there's over 2,500 young girls in sexual slave trade right in Austin. It moves right down interstates. First thing they do is they kidnap them and they take them halfway across the country. So they don't, so if, even if they jumped out of the car and tried to find help, they couldn't find anybody they know. It's a, it's a nasty business. What about pornography and, and men's brains being actually rewired by constant exposure to porn to where many of them can't even function naturally and normally with a real life woman because, unless they got the porn going on at the same time. What about women being exploited? Women were created in the image of God. Yeah. Well, tell me how porn helps that. It doesn't. It degrades women. And what does that stuff lead to? Abortion? Where did abortion come from in America? 1973, another Supreme Court decision, eight to one decision, 1973, Roe versus Wade. It came from the horizontal self. If we still had that up there, well, we don't go back. I'll get you all confused. Y'all know the picture? That's where that came from. You know what happens when sex goes out of control? Women and children suffer. Of course, the men suffer too. They're in all sorts of emotional bondage, but we don't really see or talk much about that. What about money? What's money for anyway? I mean, that's kind of a good question. Um, the horizontal self would say money is for my pleasure. I got a right. I worked hard. I got my money. I got a right. I do what I want with my money. But is there a possible other reason for having money? I think there is. I think there's a, sp a responsible reason for having money. And it's to create an, a good, safe environment for you and your family. It's to invest into your future. It's, it, a real good use of money is to help your kids get educated. But if you're drinking it up and smoking it up and you, you can't afford your kid to go wherever, there's something wrong with that. But past that, it's income tax season. You're gonna find out really quick how you spent your money this year. Because all you gotta do is look at the line of how much came in and look at your bank account and see how much is still in there. <laughs> and you get a letter from the church and, you t and we tell you how much you gave over here because we have to by law, we had to send them out by January 31. And so you can, I mean, it's not emotional. There's no emotion in it. It's black and white, bottom line. What did you do with your money last year? You know, you know. But I would tell you this, I think money is for blessing other people. Money is for blessing other people. It's not, it, yeah, I need to eat. Yeah, I need to pay the light bill and all that kind of stuff. But past that, it is so that I can be a blessing to others. That's what it's about. Susan's grandfather was a Pentecostal, born in like the teens, lived through the depression, South San Antonio, had a car lot, used car lot. Guy was a tither to the Assembly of God Church. He gave to missionaries over and above he paid cash for everything always drove a cadillac <laughs> paid cash for his house and left an inheritance he died at 80 years old and his wife ended up living until she was like 92 left an inheritance of money so that his wife never had to work never had to be on welfare or nothing like that and even left some for his grandkids that's what money's for that's what it's for it's not real hard and you know, uh, these missionaries back here, we don't just help these guys a little bit. Many of these missionaries get north of a thousand dollars a month from you guys. Why? Because they couldn't get it anywhere else. And because somebody's got to help them get, it, get the job done. These guys are counting on us. They are counting on us. These people are living 13 time zones away and every month they know they're going to get a check from San Marcos Community Church to help them keep on doing the work of the kingdom. That only happens when guys like us know what money's for, right? So God disciplines our flesh so that things go good for us. But there's more. There's something called the future self. So we've talked about the vertical self and the horizontal self, but let's look at the future self real quick. We have a 
diagram of this. Oh, there was Marilyn real quick. Uh, this is when you die right here. This is, this is your, your days are numbered, pow, right there. This is God's redeemed future for you. This is the true you. This is the new creation you. This is where we're going in Revelation chapter 22. So, so heaven's somewhere in here, but this is life after life after death. This is you now, and this is where you can go. This is where God wants you to go. This is God's goal for you. You're gonna live forever in, on this planet, rebuilt, Garden of Eden. That's where we're headed, if you choose to go there. So let's talk about that a minute. Just leave that up there for a second. People who have become followers of Jesus get to participate in resurrection. Jesus was raised. That's the big deal about Easter. It's not that some guy died on a cross. It's that some guy rose from the dead who just happened to be the son of God. And so we have 100% human, and he's also 100% God, in heaven, in God's space right now. What that means is, that means the possibility exists that I will be raised too. And that's what scripture says, is that you, if you believe and have faith in Christ, you will be raised to new creation. So, in that place, we are going to rule and reign with Christ. A deformed, fragmented self is not a very good ruler and reigner. So scripture is all about training us to get to where we're going over here. Is that okay? So we discipline and we train our flesh in order that we can rule and reign in the next life. Everything that I do, it, that I build virtue in my life right now, I carry over into there. My character. When I put up with people talking bad about me behind my back, having secret meetings, and I choose to forgive rather than they will kick their rear in like they need it done, I put it down and I say, the redneck died on the cross. I will forgive those idiots. I'm taking my character with me. Is that okay? And St. Paul, and this is why you got to read the Bible, because if you don't read the Bible, this stuff is garbly gook to you right now. You're like, that guy's crazy. That white boy is crazy up there. St. Paul talks all about this stuff in all of his letters. And he compares our life right here to an athletic competition. And he says an athlete trains and trains and trains and practices and swims 6,000 yards, not so they can be worn out and go, wow, I had a good workout today. No, there's a reason for it. It's so that when the swim meet comes or the track meet comes or the powerlifting meet comes or whatever comes or the performance or the musical performance, you are, you have practiced. You're ready. That's what St. Paul says. So we take our character into the next life. And without getting legalistic about it, because you could right here, I believe that the level that I pro am processed in this over here determines my rank in the kingdom over here. I'm, it's biblical, it's biblical. So deathbed conversions are great. You live like hell over here. You're the horizontal self. You're a big train wreck of a mess, but you found Jesus two days before you died and you actually get to new creation. You're not going to be at the same level over here as a guy who put to death the things of the flesh over here. You can call me what you want. It's biblical. So every time you want to cuss somebody out because they cut you off in traffic, but you don't, you win. You build something in yourself. And every time you're tempted to be rude or mean uh, to that telemarketer who probably is just trying to make a living but have bugged you to death and somebody sold your number and you really want to uh, break the phone over their head, but you don't, you win. And every time you turn away from porn or choose to control the portions that you're eating or to stay on your meal plan, or to say no to that purchase that you don't really need, or every time you turn the channel 
when that Holy Spirit starts getting grieved because it sneaks up on you fast, right? Every time you walk out of that movie theater because the movie just went a different way, every time you choose to live within your means instead of over your means, every time you choose joy instead of worry, I could go on and on, you win. You win. You win. You know what you're doing? You're building holiness. You're building holiness. You're building future. You're building the future self. Jesus crucified your flesh and my flesh on the cross. It's dead. But I have to appropriate that. It's not automatic. I have to appropriate that. I make my flesh, I'm speaking prophetically here because I don't always win. I'm human. I want to make my flesh bow down to me rather than me bow down to it. So it's not a matter of pulling myself up by the bootstraps and getting religious and, and, um, and working harder. It, it will require work. It will require discipline. It wor- will require some new inputs if I want the outputs to be different. But it's already done. Christ already did it. All I have to do is grab it and say, this is mine. The power to crucify the flesh has already been dealt with on the cross and I got to put it on me and I take it and I move forward in that. That's what it's about. Don't worry about the power. It's already here. It's called the Holy Spirit. So how do you think virtuous people became virtuous? There, There are some very virtuous people. There's some virtuous people right here in the room right here. How did they get there? Nobody was born any more virtuous than the other guy. Now, some people are more hot-headed than other people. And there's some more passive people, and passive people look pretty good on the outside, but they're just as evil as hot-headed people. It's just that it's hidden. Oh, if I could only be more like him. Well, we're not so sure what's really going on there, you know, so we don't need to go there. But anyway, I don't care if you are a ballet dancer or a great musician or an incredible basketball player. Michael Jordan talked about how hard he worked to be who Michael Jordan is or whether you're a martial artist or whatever you are, you don't get good at it unless you practice, 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 practice. And that's what St. Paul's letters are about. So then there's the third thing that we need to talk about, and that is the deteriorated self. We have a diagram of that. Here's the problem, is that here you are now, here's the future self if you so choose to do it, but here's your deteriorated or diminished self. Every time you don't practice the right stuff, you don't just stay stagnant, you start losing ground. I wish that wasn't the case, but it is. This is why the old timers would use the word backsliding, sliding back because they know that there's no such thing as a stagnant place. You're either moving into the true you in holiness or you're moving back to a deteriorated you. This is Bible preaching, people, to be honest with you, I, you know. And so your fleshly desires, if they're not tamed, they're pulling you this way. Boom, they're pulling you that way. And this is what happens with cultural Christians. Remember we talked last week that there's three kind of people in America today. There's some folks that are outside of faith. They're, they're not, in, not in Jesus today. That's the majority of Americans. Then there's some cultural Christians. Some of them come to church. They come to church once a month or twice a month or twice a year or sometimes a lot. But they're cultural Christians. And then there's the remnant. These are disciples. These are people that say, I'm taking this stuff serious, man, and 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 I'm I'm seeing change in my life, and I'm getting victory. I don't win every day. Sometimes I get knocked down, but I get back up, I keep winning. Those are the three kind of people. So here's the problem with being a cultural Christian. In truth, um, their lives are moving this way over here, and they don't look any different than the culture. And the culture looks at them and says, there's nothing different about you. Oh, oh, yeah, you, you went to church on Sunday and I chose to um, play golf or I went to the movies, which is the secular temple where they learn theology, by the way, is at the movies and at like uh, 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 
Prime video and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, they say, oh, well, you went to church, but you're no different than me because I can tell how you spend your money, how you act and everything else. You're a cultural Christian. You're no different, right? So your life looks the same as the others. And so in the terms of thought life, entertainment spending, uh, giving habits and all that stuff, you're the same as the culture. And that's where some people are. That kind of life will not stand up when the fire hits, though the firestorm because you have your house built on sand and not on the rock and that's what Jesus said he said don't build your house on sand build it on the rock and so when something happens that rocks your world and you have not invested going this way and you've been a cultural Christian and you think you're stagnant but in reality you're about over here when something comes to rock your world you got nothing all the stuff that used to work, you don't have anymore. You can't grab it. It isn't there no more. Somebody move my walker. Somebody move my cane. Somebody, I'm falling here, people. That kind of deal. The sad thing about it is you don't know it. Because you're so much a part of the culture, you think you're probably here and maybe right here. But reality is you're way over here. And you're getting your rear end kicked. So the storms of life knock you flat. And you won't survive the, the cultural collapse that we're seeing now in America why because you are one of them you're going down with the boat so you know Jesus sees everything and so he sees the giving statements nobody else saw it he sees the entertainment he sees your thought life he sees the secret words and worlds that you think about and live in he sees the secret deals he sees the dirty little situations he sees the fantasy thought life he sees the compromises made so i guess you could take today as a warning i'm just preaching bible, bible preaching you know but it's a warning it's a warning that if you are a cultural christian and, you know, you think you're as good as everybody else sitting in a room here today. The reality is probably if you're a cultural Christian, you're not as far over here as you think. You're probably more over here. And you're warned, man. You've been warned. Because you don't know how many days you got left. I don't know how many days you have left. So you got to drop what you're doing. You got to reevaluate the direction. And you got to repent. And that means turn around and go Godward instead of self-word, right? So what does it look like? You say, well, you know, everybody kind of has an opinion. What does it look like? Well, pretty much this. A good way to judge it would be, do I love Jesus now more than I did at the beginning? Um, am I more concerned with Jesus' agenda on the planet today than with my agenda? And the third one is, am I sacrificing more of my money and more of my time and more of my energy for God now than I did at the beginning? That would be good questions to ask. We're done, except that I want to show you about a six minute video of an interesting thing. And you can see this on YouTube if you want. It's a reality show that happened in Great Britain in 2005. A very fascinating thing where, now you gotta know, Great Britain is way postmodern. I mean, post-Christian, right? They're way out there, like way out there. They're so far out, you know, here in America, we're still in this whole thing where Christianity is a bunch of junk, throw that, any, ABC, anything but Christian. We're still in that dialogue. Let's get prayer out of school, let's get prayer out of the, state house let's get prayer out of the city council we're still in that goofiness britain went through that stuff 50 years ago they're so far down the line that if you talk about jesus they won't really well, they're not they'll talk about it so anyway the bbc this is amazing did this deal where there's a catholic monastery full of benedictine monk, monks and they said would you guys open up your monastery for 40 days if we could pick five people from the culture to come live with you, we would be interested to see if there's any change in these people. And so it's interesting that a bunch of people applied for this thing. And the B, I don't know how many, maybe 150 something people. But anyway, the B, maybe more. The BBC selected 
the five people that could be in this reality show. And these guys went and submitted to the monastery and to the monks. It's, it's a Benedictine monastery, so it's the rule of St. Benedict, which has been around 600 AD. And what are monasteries famous for? They're really famous for developing the soul and putting to flesh the death of the flesh. And so these guys, and I mean, these are some crazy dudes. Uh, it's worth watching, to be honest. It's a three-part series. It's on YouTube. You, you just put in the Monastery BBC, and you'll see, uh, you'll see one, episode one, episode two, and episode three. They're hour-long each. It's fascinating to watch this stuff. But the clip I want to show you is from one of the guys, and this guy's 29 years old. He's a good-looking guy. He's in the porn industry. He started out in advertising and he's in the soft porn business and that's what he does for a living. And he come to the monastery and he didn't believe, none of these people no, believe anything about God, nothing like that. And he came to the monastery and this, is, this uh, thing that you're about to see is on about day 35 of 40. So he's been there 35 days. Now they go to church six times a day in the monastery. They pray, they eat in silence, they work, they pray some more. That, that's that whole rhythm, okay? So this is an interesting conversation. It's about a six-minute video of, of kind of the end of that, and then we're going to be done. So let's watch this real quick. With only two days to go, Tony is growing increasingly agitated at the prospect of returning to his normal life. Aware that his past behavior has been uncaring and even self-destructive, He's worried that what he's learned in the monastery may not be enough to sustain him. He decides to seek advice from his spiritual guide, Brother Francis, during their last session together. Gary said something to me earlier about what I'm going to do when I get back, job-wise. He said, are you going to give up? Are you going to give up your, your job? You know, sort of, basically sort of on kind of like moral, mm. oblique, spiritual grounds. And I said, well, no, no, I'm not, because... Uh, I'm not going to go sit in a church reading the Bible and, and eating, you know, pot noodles. Mm. You know, I need to live. I need to. Have, mm. I need, need, need my lifestyle. You know. Mm. So. <clears throat> so I'm just a little bit worried. Part of me really wants to keep the whole thing alive mm. and carry it through. Mm. And um, and I know the part of me that the minute I get out, it, it, there'll be a, a little bit of like, whew, mm. you know, sort of been there, done, yeah. done that, and it will fade. Mm. Um, I want to give you something to, um, I think, to help with what you've just described, really. And I think that over these last week, I think it is, you've been talking about vocation. And I think that's, that's very important. And vocation's about, you know, discovering who, who you really are and maybe what you should really be doing. And I think that's what we try and do here, is to discover who we really are. And... Uh, I want, to, I, want, I want to give you this stone, this white stone. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think for several reasons, I think. We've got, our, we've got our Christian name, we've got our family name, but we've got another name, and it's called our white stone name. And that's, that comes from the book of Revelations, where the angel says that there's, your name is written on a white stone in heaven. And I think our vocation is to find out what that name is. And, uh, and I think that's, that's a lifelong quest. But you could keep this in your pocket. Yeah. And you could just hold that um, when, it, when it gets tough. But also f remember the story that you're trying to work out, well, what's my white name? What am I really meant to be doing? Who am I really meant to be? And I don't think you'll go far wrong. I hope that'll help with that. Well, I hope it does as well. I mean, just talking, just sitting here now, I just feel, com I do really feel quite confused by this whole thing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And uh, it's, it is easy to kind of verbalise things and, or just verbalise anything mm -hmm. for the sake of yeah. wrapping it up in, in words, but, yeah. you know. I wouldn't bother. I wouldn't bother. I 
It's the weirdest experience I've ever had in my life. I don't know. I think, you know, I think I'm... It was a religious experience. Profound, quite profoundly. Or I was sharing a religious experience with Francis. I think that's pretty clear. changed everything. Something happened. Something touched me. Something spoke to me very deeply and very profoundly. But I tell you something, right, and this is me talking. This isn't someone that wanted this to happen or expected it to. When I woke up this morning, I didn't believe in this. And as I, as I speak to you now, I, I, I do. Whatever it is, and I still don't know what that is, I believe in it, because I saw it, and I felt it, and it spoke to me. And that's something which will stay with me for the rest of my life. That's what needs to happen with some of you guys today. You know, you need to say, man, I give up. Into your hands, Lord, I commend my spirit. And what would you have me spend the rest of my days doing? And so, how do you start? Well, it starts with a prayer. During communion here, I think God wants to do some deep work in our lives. But, but just on a practical level, you could commit yourself and your family to a good church. This is a good church, but if you don't like me or you don't like the leadership here, don't sit around and be, have a bad attitude about it. Go find a good church. There's a bunch of them around. I work tirelessly in this corridor community to see churches flourish. And there's a lot of good churches here. So find a good church. That might be the first thing. The second thing, you see, a, a local church and a local family is very similar to a monastery. Actually, the problem is we have too much freedom. If we could meet six times a day for prayer like these things we would see amazing things happen but you know we got kids to raise and we got to get them to school and we got jobs and we got all this kind of stuff however you can have a monastic lifestyle in the midst of it but you have to do it on purpose and so a good thing you could do is set aside time daily to meet with God silence and solitude Bible reading prayer you say well I don't know how to pray neither do these guys so that's why we do Monday night prayer come to Monday night prayer learn how to pray practice it fellowship that happens on Monday night too 
where kind of we get to know each other better. You, you know, you've you got to get rid of some other friends to get some new friends if you want to go in a new direction. That's all there is to it. And then be others focused right now. This, this secular thing is all about me, narcissism. Me, 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 me. And, and what God's about, when God starts healing you on the inside, you're able to be others focused. And that's what God wants. And you've got to start practicing it now. So anyway, let's just kind of close our time here. We're going to have communion. Father God, I just uh, thank you that you don't leave us to just flounder around and wonder which direction to go, but you actually give us direction. And I pray for everybody in the room here today that new direction will be released. And we just, uh, we just say that when it's the voice of the Holy Spirit, there's crystal clear direction. You'll know exactly what you need to do. When it's the voice of the devil, there'll be a general condemnation. And it'll all be a muddled, gloomy mess. And in the name of Jesus, we take authority over that. There will be none of that on our people. The only spirit allowed in this building is the Holy Spirit. And in this room, right now, conviction and direction is being released. You know exactly the, 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 por- the one thing that, needs to, that something needs to happen in. And so during the communion time, if you're a smart person, you will begin to pray about that. And you'll say, God, help me. Show me what to do. Okay? That's, that's, it's really simple. Christianity is made for simple people. And, and that's where we have to, to start and stop this thing. So I just, Holy Spirit of the living God, I ask that you move among us. You, you are wanting to form us and shape us and you love, we are loved. And there's a purpose for our lives. And the days of just wasting our time need to be over. And so come help us in the name of Jesus. The first step to walking into the true you is admitting that we're a sinner and receiving the love of God, receiving the forgiveness of God. Everyone can participate in that. The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And and the first step to moving towards God is to renounce our sin. And so if y'all would, we're going to say a prayer that's going to confess our sins together. So if y'all would stand with me. And we're going to repeat this prayer, um, remind us, remind God, not only that are we sinners, but we're in need of a Savior, we're in need of someone to help us, and, and only through Him can we enter into that true self. It's the first step. So let's do this together. My God, I am sorry for my sins with all my heart. In choosing to do wrong and failing to do good, I have sinned against you, whom I should love above all things. I firmly intend, with your help, to sin no more and to avoid whatever leads me to sin. Our Savior, Jesus Christ, suffered and died for us. In his name, my God, have mercy. Amen. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, we can have a sinless, holy life. We can live like that for God. And he takes all of our sin away. And that's the beauty of communion, what we're going to share today. Um, What's going to happen is you're going to be dismissed row by row. The ushers are going to come forward and dismiss you. You're going to grab the bread and the juice, and you're going to take it back to your seat, um, meditate on it, worship for a while, and then we're going to come back up here and we're going to pray over it together. And we're going to take them all together. So let's go ahead and go for it. We've got uh, Diana Ng and Mary Pate um, to pray over the elements for us, leaders of one of our women's Bible studies. Dear Lord, we come and take this communion to remember your death and your resurrection. And by obeying Father God, you defeated death. And you took away the sins of the world for all those who receive you and believe you and trust you and obey you. And Lord God, you are good. You are so good. And um, we thank you for allowing us into your kingdom and partaking of this bread of life 
body of Christ. Oh Lord, you fill us with good things and you can transform us. You can change us. You can take away the old self and replace it with the new. Thank you, Lord. Please take the bread. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your love and your goodness. Just this morning, just during worship and in this place, Lord, today, you just, we can feel your love pouring out on us. Um, you are so good and so kind. And this juice, it represents that love also. This, the work has been done for us. Jesus, by dying on the cross and by your blood, our sins are forgiven. Amen. We are no longer slaves to sin. The chains are broken. You have given us victory and eternal life in all that is good. You've given us an abundant life. So we just thank you for that today. We love you, God. Thank you for your goodness and your love. Please take the juice. Amen. Well, I want to bless you all with new beginnings this week, second chances, any area of failure, any area of, of, of badness that has happened, um, I just want to speak life into that this week. And I just feel like the Lord's saying that there's a new beginning that's happening. And He wants to start that today. And so I just speak new beginnings, second chances over everyone here. Receive it. Take it with you as you go. Um, if you need prayer for anything in specific, we're going to have our prayer teams up here in the front. Um, and we're going to be here tomorrow for Monday night prayer as well to pray for our city, community, nation, world, everything. So come on down for that. So have an awesome week. Have an awesome day. Come up for prayer if you need it. Amen.